Hello class, welcome to our first exercise technique lecture on the squat and hinge pattern. Um, so we'll be talking about our squat and hinge today. We'll talk about our other primary movement patterns in some subsequent lectures. So looking at this first, this is the squat pattern. So the squat pattern is a movement of the pelvis. It's a bilateral hinging pattern with um, much more knee flexion incorporated. Um, with the squat pattern, we are often axially loaded. Um, that means that the weight is being distributed um, through our spinal column. Um, as you can see here, these, these individuals have the barbell on their back or in a front rack position. Um, from this position, we are able to lower and then lift um, whatever load that we are, we are encountering for that specific exercise. Um, this is slightly different compared to our hinge pattern. Hinge pattern um, has much less knee flexion involved, um, but it is still the same um, hip flexion, hip extension movement that we see in the squat pattern. And we are often not axially loaded. We are some, in some instances, there is axial loading hinge patterns, for example, the good morning exercise. Um, but in most of our hinge patterns, we're going to use some form of deadlift variation where the resistance is in the hands and we are um, performing the concentric portion of the lift in order to raise the resistance and then the eccentric portion to lower the resistance. With the squat pattern, we begin with the eccentric portion and then follow that with the concentric portion. That's one of the major differences between the deadlift and the squat, the load, the position of the load as well as the order of muscle actions. Um, but they are both a bilateral hinging or, or hip flexion, hip extension movement at the pelvis, at the hip joint. Uh, the hinge has less knee flexion, the squat has more knee flexion. But in general, we're, we're rotating the pelvis around the X axis. So this is a sagittal plane bilateral movement in which the pelvis is rotating in space, um, moving into hip flexion and hip extension and back and forth depending on um, the phase of that lift and the specific lift being involved. But they are, the, the similarities here is the x-axis as you can see here. Um, imagine you put a pin through the side of your pelvis and now you're rotating around that axis, moving the pelvis, dumping forward and pulling it back. So it's rotating forward and backward um, within the sagittal plane. So we'll start with the squat pattern okay, and then we'll follow with the, the deadlift or the hinge pattern. Um, so with the squat pattern, there's a lot of different um, major pieces that we, we talk about or that are argued about. Um, the first one is the foot um, position. So when we're looking at transfer to athleticism, okay, we want to look at a toes forward position. Um, that means that the feet are, are in line with the pelvis and the sagittal plane. They're not towing out. Um, they're not towing in, so they're not, toes aren't pointing towards each other or away from the center. They're going forward. Um, the feet are in a position that is similar to what we see in sprinting, change of directions. Um, so this is our toes forward position. If you're looking at a powerlifting or weightlifting squat, um, you may have a slightly more toed out position, which will allow for a little bit more opening of the hips. Um, that extra abduction and external rotation allows for more hip flexion. It leaves room for the, the femur to move closer to the pelvis and closer to the body. And it allows for slightly more ankle range of motion. So uh, if you're looking for a deep or, or all the way down squat, um, full depth squat where the, the hamstring is covering the calf, um, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, you may need a more toed out position. But if we're looking for transfers specifically to athleticism, we want to use a toes forward position. The next one is the knee position. Do we want the knees over the toes or not? Um, it really depends on the athlete's range of motion as well as what the athlete is looking to do. Um, if we're using a more athletic based squat, which is a more hip dominant pattern um, with that toes forward position, our knees are going to go forward and track in line with the feet. Uh, but they may or may not pass the toe depending on your femur length, your ankle range of motion. Um, there are uh, many different factors. The lower you go in a squat, the deeper the squat position, the more forward the knee is going to track in most cases. Um, that's not dangerous as long as the athlete has the range of motion and has the stability 
and mobility required to reach that position under load. Um, if you're using a more weightlifting style squat where you have a more or toed out position, you're likely going to have a lot more forward knee movement in order to um, allow the hips to move further down. And you'll often have a more upright torso position, the, forward, the more forward the knees track, similar to a front squat, you'll likely have more forward knee movement compared to something like a back squat or a low bar back squat, um, which you see in the bottom left video or the bottom left image, which is more of a hip dominant pattern, low bar back squat, you're going to have less forward knee movement. Um, the next question is, do the hips go back or do the hips go down? It depends. So it depends on the style of squat. If we're doing a wide stance powerlifting squat, like you see in the top right, you're likely going to have a more hip back position, um, which is going to end up in going hips down, but they're more shooting backwards to keep the load over the knee and over the base of, of the foot to primarily load the hip musculature rather than the knee musculature. We know the hip musculature from our, our more dynamic lectures, the, the, the hip musculature in the posterior chain is going to be a key position. So we want to load that in that sense. So we would put a more hips back position. If we're doing more of a front squat or a very deep squat or more upright torso squat, the hips are going to have to go down in order to allow that upright torso. So really our torso position is going to um, coordinate our hip position, hip position, coordinate the torso, depending on the type of squat we're doing, the variation that we're doing, that all variations are not created equal, um, but they all have their application. The next one is to breathe or not breathe. breathe. Um, so we want to, in most cases with your general population, we um, breathe in on the way down and we breathe out on the way up. That is a safe way to breathe. You're going to improve the brace. We're really trying to load that athlete. We're going to want to incorporate the Valsalva maneuver, which is where we take a deep breath in and lock down our epiglottis so that the breath is, is held inside of us to increase the stiffness of our torso. Um, and then that exhale can come out normally, either after the end of the lift or during the last phase of the concentric portion where we are really trying to um, exhibit the most amount of force. If we breathe out as we produce force, we can often get a little bit of a bump there. Um, but depending on your athlete, depending on the need, um, we will coordinate the breath accordingly. Um, where do my arms go? Depending on the type of squat, um, it depends on our squat position. So if we're using a front squat, for example, we'll talk about it in the technique portion. Um, our hands are going to be only as far apart um, as you can allow for external rotation at the shoulder. So some individuals may have greater external rotation range of motion at the shoulder, which means they can have a slightly wider grip on the barbell. If you have very little external rotation range of motion on the shoulder, you're going to have to have a hands closer position in your front squat. Similarly with your back squat, the more external rotation you have, the closer your hands can be to each other, which does increase the amount of tension you can create in your upper back. Um, so between the scapulae in the shoulder complex and the upper back, we can create more stiffness the closer our hands are. Um, but we only go as close as we can allow range of motion. So if you don't have that range of motion, your hands are going to have to be slightly farther away. Um, when we're in a back squat position, we want the elbows to face in line with the body. Um, so in most cases, that's going to be straight down underneath the barbell. If we're in a front squat position, we want the humerus to be parallel with the ground, and we want the, uh, the tip of the elbow to point directly forward for as much of that lift as absolutely possible. Um, that will keep that upright torso position, keep a stable rack position so that we can lift that barbell. And lastly, what should my back do? This also depends on the hip motion, um, but we do need that hinge portion. So if in a back squat, you're going to have more torso lean. In a, more, in a front squat, you're going to have more of an upright torso position, which distributes the loads more evenly between the hip and the knee, as opposed to the back squat, which is a little bit more dominant around the hip compared to the knee joint musculature. Um, so there's many different avenues, different, different things we can talk about here with the squat position, um, different types of squats. Um, but we're going to today for our technique portion of the lecture, go through the back squat and the front squat um, setup and execution. Okay, with our deadlift position, we also want to have that feet forward position. We likely don't want to have a toes out position 
uh, unless we're doing maybe a sumo style deadlift or a very specific type of deadlift or we need excessive range of motion or if we're transferring to the sport of Olympic weightlifting, which you have a slightly more toed out position when you pull so that the bar can stay closer with a more upright torso. We'll get into that in our weightlifting section. You may have a slightly more toed out position. However, with the deadlift, we want to have as much of a toes forward position in most cases as possible. Um, there's another question of should I do a conventional deadlift compared to a sumo deadlift? It depends. If you're competing in powerlifting and you're better at the sumo deadlift and it helps you lift more weight, that's a sport. That's the execution of the sport. You're trying to lift more weight off the ground. When it comes to transfer for athleticism, we use the conventional deadlift as our primary deadlift, the sumo deadlift as an accessory movement to um, maybe improve the adductor muscle strength, per improve muscle strength with a more upright torso, which you'll see more in a, or in a sumo deadlift compared to a conventional deadlift. Um, it just distributes the torque around the joints differently, so we need to apply it differently. Um, when it comes to breathing and not breathing, um, we do want to take in that brace before we lift the weight off the ground to increase intra-abdominal pressure so that we can have a more stiff and stable spine. Um, so breathing in before the lift is recommended. Control and holding that breath on the way down as much as possible is recommended to increase the stiffness of the spine because there is a sheer loading on the spine. Um, it's not loaded um, straight up and down through the spine. So we do want to add as much strength as we can using our breath and bracing against that breath. Um, when it comes to where do my arms go, with most deadlift, we are a conventional deadlift. We're just going to move our arms straight down. We'll talk about this in our execution portion. Wherever they are from your shoulders, put your hands down and grab the barbell. In most cases, it's going to be a, about a thumb width to half a thumb width between the smooth part and the knurling of the barbell in most barbells. Um, so that's kind of a good recommendation to start your athletes, say a thumbs width away. It's going to put them in a normally a pretty advantageous position. And lastly, what should my back do? Um, we want to keep a neutral spine as much as possible throughout the deadlift. Um, if you're a power lifter, there may be some, some variations that you have to do in order to achieve that, like a, a little bit more thoracic flexion, upper back flexion. Um, but when it comes to transfer to athleticism, we want to create a neutral spine, have a neutral head posture. So the same posture we talk about in our um, postural section, we want to set up in that same posture. And then we want to go to the barbell um, in that hip flex, knee flex position with that stable spine and to um, perform hip extension as aggressively as we can um, in order to bring the weight up. We'll talk more about that in our setup and execution. Today, we're going to talk about the conventional deadlift and the trap bar deadlift or hex bar deadlift, um, which you can see in the top left photo. Um, this puts the hands in a neutral position. This is a slightly different variation. It's a different bar um, that you may not have access to, but there is some transfer to athleticism, so we're going to spend some time talking about it. Okay, so now let's start with the setup and execution of the back squat exercise. Um, so I have some videos set up, um, looking at our setup and our execution, we'll talk through some major points. Um, as you're watching, take some notes so that we can talk more about these when we get together and talk about them. Um, but here's our setup. So we initially walk up to the barbell and we're going to uh, place our hands at our specific width. For my specific width, it is about a thumb's width away from the knurling and the smooth edge of the barbell. So as you can see here, there's the smooth part of the barbell and then the knurling, that's the rough part of the barbell. Um, we want to go about a thumb's width away is where my range of motion allows. Some athletes, it may be further away. Some athletes, it may be closer. But that's a pretty standard grip width for most of our exercises. Keeping consistency with your athletes can help um, in teaching and learning the lifts from the start. So we keep this standard thumbs width away from the smooth part um, or thumbs width away from the edge of the knurling as our standard. We place the barbell on the upper back on the trapezius muscle, the upper trapezius, creating a shelf um, with the scapula and the upper trapezius. We do not wanna place the barbell on our neck or on our cervical spine. We want to load it a little bit lower than that. It's just above um, thoracic vertebrae number two, in between uh, two and one in most cases for the high bar back squat or standard back squat. Um, 
when we set up underneath the bar, we want to place both of our feet underneath the barbell in this kind of eighth of a squat, quarter squat position. We do not want to lunge into the barbell. We want to stand underneath and then we grab the bar and stand up with the bar. Okay, after that, we are going to step out or step back with the barbell. So we'll watch here, lift the bar up, step out. The fewer steps you can take, the better. We descend and we rise. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back again through each of those pieces. Stand in, set your grip from the start, step underneath the barbell, stand it up, step out into your toes forward position, feet are about um, shoulder width to slightly beyond shoulder width apart. We descend with, because we're doing our back squat, we're looking at a hip dominant exercise. We are going to push our hips back as we flex our knees. That happens together at the same time. So we're not going hips, then knees, knees, then hips. We're going together and we push our hips back into that loaded position, keeping that neutral spine and we lower to our range of motion. So here we have my range of motion. My knee is tracking in line with my forward foot. My knee is about over the instep or the, the midfoot position. It's not going too far forward. I'm loading. You can see that that torque is being placed on my hip. My back is in a nice stable position. My elbows are in line with my body, in line with the barbell. And then I aggressively extend the hip to rise out of that position. So grab the bar, unrack the barbell with two feet, step out in as few steps as possible into that foot position load and explode on the way up. We always want to be aggressively lifting the barbell because that's going to get the transfer to sport. If we lift slowly, we move slowly. So we always want to aggressively perform the concentric portion of our lifts. So here we can see it from the front, grab the barbell, set up underneath the barbell, stand up, step out, load the hip, explode out. Re-rack the barbell, I do not recommend unracking the barbell facing out of the squat rack because you cannot see the hooks. However, I did so just because I do not have a square rack for my demonstrations. Um, so you can better see where my body position is. So let's look at a few other angles. Um, looking specifically at that hand position and my elbow position. We're going to set up underneath the bar on the trapezius. Step underneath the bar, rise. Step out, toes forward, load the hip, explode out of that position. Lastly, another forward view. We are going to grab our grip position. Having a standard grip position helps you balance that barbell and have a, the same repetition every single time. Toes forward, load the hip, explode out. That range of motion is dictated by your athlete's range of motion. Um, we want to shoot for about the thigh parallel to the floor or the hip crease at or below the knee joint for our kind of our standard. But if your athlete doesn't have that range of motion yet, work through that, but keep teaching the exercise, keep training, keep learning and lifting the weights. And as you progress your way down into more and more range of motion, don't give up the chance to um, experience load because they don't have full range of motion. As long as they can keep posture, we're set to load that athlete, okay? So we're going to look again here. As you see our setup with light weights should be the same setup as we do with heavy weights. So we unrack, step into that position, load and explode as we do with every single one, regardless of the weight. So as we grab a heavier barbell, okay, as opposing 135 to 335, we should rack the barbell the same, lift the weight the same, step out the same, load and explode the same. You're going to have slight variations as the weight gets heavier, but it's our job to practice and continually train our athletes to have the same execution regardless of the load. As we see, 
every single repetition is aggressive on the way up. The slower we lift on the way up, the less transfer we have to explosive movements that we see in sport. So we need to execute heavily on our compensatory acceleration or accelerate the bar as we get more advantageous range of motion. Okay, so think through this, take some notes. We'll, we'll talk some more a little about execution here um, when we move on. Next, we'll look at the front squat exercise. This is a great chance to pause, think back to what we talked about, and now we'll go into the front squat exercise. So with the front squat, um, we know that our, our hand position is going to be dictated by our external range of motion um, and our ability to get in that front rack position. Okay, my range of motion isn't as great for external rotation for the front squat right now, so I'm going to have my hands much closer, ju just about outside the width of your shoulders. So if you think about the width of your deltoids, that's a good starting position for your athletes. If you just have them reach their arms straight forward and grab the bar, that's normally going to be a good grip width for their front squat to start. Okay, we want to unrack the bar on the front of the shoulders, front of the deltoid, um, just behind the collarbone up against the neck. So this may be uncomfortable at the start. We don't want this to be further down on the shoulder. We don't want to internally rotate the shoulders. We want to keep this externally rotated position so we can engage the upper back and train those thoracic stabilizers using this exercise. We will often have a much more upright torso with the front squat. If you have a forward tipping torso like we saw in the back squat, you are going to lose that weight out in front of you. It's going to fall off of your shoulders. So this front squat position forces a more upright torso which loads less on the hip and more to the knee, gives us a little bit more even transfer between the two joints of where that load is applied. Um, if you have a trained athlete, they'll likely be able to front squat about 80 to 85% of their best back squat. So that's a good range. If they're lower than that, we know that they need to train the front squat. If they're above that 85% of their back squat, their maximal strength in the back squat is probably limiting their strength in the front squat. Okay. So we look at the setup, those elbows are pointing forward, the bar is racked on the front of the shoulders, and the descent is knees and hips together, but the, the hips go down more than back compared to the back squat exercise. The range of motion, as we can also see, is a little bit farther. Um, I have a more toed out position with my front squat um, to allow more ankle range of motion, allow me to sit into a full depth front squat, which transfers to things like um, clean and jerk movements, snatch movements, um, weightlifting derivatives, um, which I personally compete in. So that's where I have more of my, my execution is going to transfer to. Um, it also allows a more upright torso position, um, but the toe out position is maybe 30 degrees at maximum. We want to keep as, as forward a foot as we possibly can with our front squat execution. Um, the more we can transfer, the more we can, we can use for other things, not just exercise. If you have a general population client, as long as they're safe and executing in their proper joint alignment, you're probably okay. Um, so we can see from, from the posterior view, same unracked position, step out as few steps as possible, descend with a hips down position, and rise. Okay, we want that bar to go in a linear bar path up and down. We want to keep the foot flat on the ground. Okay, so we have unrack, even with heavier resistance, we want to unrack the same position, step in the same way, and execute the lift with aggression on the way up. Okay, we want to move the bar faster in the concentric portion of the lift. That's going to give us the most transfer to our sport. Okay, now we'll move on to the barbell deadlift. So that we are still sticking with that um, squat hinge pattern that um, flexion extension of the hips in a bilateral movement. Our deadlift, we, we often get these, these talks of, oh, is the deadlift good? Is the deadlift bad? Deadlift's bad for my back. This hurts my back. Um, it's not a good movement. It is a good movement. Okay, let's look at setup and execution and what could go right, what could go wrong. Okay, so our setup, we want to walk up to the barbell, approach the barbell to the middle. Our feet will be closer in distance than the back squat. So likely underneath the hip, if you look at the line of my, the edge of my hips compared to the edge of my feet, I'm pretty much in line there. I want my toes forward position. 
I approach the barbell. You want the barbell to cover your shoelaces, so that knot on your shoelaces. If you look down, you should not be able to see that knot. Uh, you should be looking directly at the barbell. That's a good distance for you. The further out, the more torque it's going to place on the, on the lower back. We want to keep the bar as close as possible. It's going to give us the most linear bar path and the best transfer. So we're going to reach our arms straight down to the bar. So we reach down, grab that thumbs width away from the edge of the knurling, grab the bar, set that back position, lift, lower in the same way and sit back down. As we can see, there's less knee flexion and extension, more hip range of motion. The bar is also on the ground as opposed to on the back. So I'll watch again. We grab the bar, about our thumbs width away. Grab the bar. We have a toes forward foot position. Grab the bar tight and we start to set our posture. From here, we have the hips and the knees. Everything is in line, the knee is over the foot. The arms are outside the knees. The knees are pushing outward to create some external rotation torque. The armpit is directly over the barbell. That's a big key. It's going to give us the best way to pull the bar in a straight line. And then we execute the push into the ground. So we don't want to try to yank the bar off the ground. We want to push the ground and allow the bar to stand us up. So now let's look from the side position, same setup, same execution. We grab the bar, we set our spine position, and we lift. So that initial setting, we are creating tension in our upper back, tension throughout our lower back, loading those hip musculature. You should feel tightness in the hamstrings and the glutes before you push off the ground. You need to create that tension, feel a, a kind of a contraction in the upper back and then tension through the hamstrings and then we push the ground. So I am aggressively pushing the ground down as I try to lift my torso up or pull the bar towards my, my hip crease. Push ends there. And now I just reverse my concentric movement. So I push the hips backwards, keeping that posture. I'm in that same exact posture I set up with. And then I finish with lowering the bar down. If we look from a posterior view, it's the exact same. Every single rep should look the exact same. Okay, set up and push and lower back down. Okay, we create that tension and then that aggressive push against the ground with that strong stable back position. Push the ground, shoot the hips back and lower to the ground. The bar should stay directly underneath the armpits the entire time. Okay, I'll give you two more views. You can have a side view and kind of a, a posterior lateral view. Notice the setup, contraction, tension, push, and then hinge back into that position. Again, set up in the exact same way. These are all different reps. We're looking at the same setup and push. As we can see here, the bar stays underneath the armpits and everything just moves around the bar. The bar should not be in control. You should be in control. Keep it in the same spot and push the ground away and sit back down. Most athletes will try to lift the bar off the ground rather than push the ground, which causes a break in the back. Um, or, or kind of a rounding into the lower back or say pull using the arms, the elbows begin to flex. We want the arms to stay in the same position, the back in the same position and use our knee and our hip to push the ground away as we execute the lift. This also looks like our universal athletic position. So if we look at that hinged posture, hinge and push, if I look at a pause through that hinge position, it looks the exact same as our universal athletic position, which is where we jump from, where we change directions from. It's our power position. So we want to transfer that power position using our primary sagittal plane lifts. Okay, 
Now we'll look at the hex bar or the trap bar. Um, we'll look at them next to each other. So looking at the deadlift compared to the trap bar deadlift, we can see here if I pause it, if I, I'll pause after, these look almost the same. There are slight variations in the setup. So with the trap bar, we're going to see a greater amount of knee flexion compared to the um, straight bar. We'll often have a higher hand position, so we can have a more upright torso as opposed to a more forward lean torso. And we're going to have a little bit more knee musculature involvement compared to strictly hip musculature involvement that we see in the straight bar deadlift. Trap bar deadlift also takes less technical execution because now you don't have to watch the bar moving around your body or move your body around the bar. You can just stand up and the bar is not going to get in your way. So there are some benefits um, to the, the hex bar execution, but it is a different variation. It does look a little bit more like our athletic position. It's a slightly more um, conducive to learning or if you have extremely tall athletes, it's likely better for them, especially if they have less range of motion. Using the trap bar is a great variation um, to still have this bilateral hinging movement without having to put the athlete in a position that they cannot handle um, based on maybe their range of motion, their levers, their current strength potential. Um, it's a great variation. If you have an athlete who can't actually load so loading anything on top of their body. Using the trap bar keeps an upright torso and is similar to a squat variation, but it has less axial loading. Maybe better for an athlete with maybe a, a back injury. Um, so keep it in our toolbox if we have available to it. Um, and if we look at that execution, if we set up for that trap bar deadlift, it looks even more like our universal athletic position. So. Maybe it is a little bit more transfer for some athletes compared to the straight bar, um, but straight bar deadlift is often what we're going to have access to in most facilities. So it's best to learn that straight bar deadlift first, and then we can always, we always have an easier learning curve on the, on the hex bar or the trap bar um, compared to the straight bar. So we learn execution of the straight bar first because that trap bar will always follow suit. You'll always be able to use more resistance using the trap bar compared to the straight bar, um, just because it puts you in a much more advantage position to produce force and to move larger amounts of resistance. Um, so I want you to think of these for our discussion topics while we're in class, some similarities, differences between the lifts. Um, we'll talk about some cueing and progressions. Mobility and range of motion is a big one. Just because your athlete can't squat um, as low as you want them to doesn't mean they shouldn't perform squat variations. Just because they can't lift the bar from the floor yet with their posture because they don't have that hip range of motion doesn't mean they shouldn't be lifting weights from the floor. We can always change the range of motion to what the athlete can do. If you have an older adult who has an issue with their knee or an issue with their hip, create a variation to allow them to still train and load without loading the range of motion that they can't achieve yet. They will be able to achieve that range of motion if you can coach them and allow for progression. So just because you can't do it now doesn't mean you won't be able to do it in a couple months. So keep progressing that way. If you only work on range of motion and never load, when that athlete gets to that range of motion, they still won't be strong in that range of motion. So we need to progress them together rather than in isolation. With loading variations, um, we'll talk about some of those, those loading progressions, um, velocities, um, some benefits and drawbacks to each, uh, muscle action order. That's a huge one when it looks at concentric to eccentric or eccentric into concentric. Are you allowed to use the stretch shortening cycle? Squatting inherently has a stretch shortening cycle component. Deadlifting does not. So if we look at concentric force development compared to stretch shortening cycle rate of force development, which one may have a better transfer? Um, how does that play into your programming and periodization over time? Okay, so if we look at these two, these two similarities and differences just for the sake of this lecture, if we look at these two squats, we see we have greater hip range of motion 
greater knee range of motion in the front squat, less in the back squat. Greater hip in the back squat, less hip range of motion in the front squat. Greater ankle, ankle range of motion in the front squat, less ankle range of motion in the back squat. That's fine, they have their own execution. So if I'm really trying to target the, the knee musculature, I'll likely use the front squat compared to the back squat. If I'm trying to transfer to things like jumping, explosive movements, more athletic movements, I will likely use the back squat to a greater extent because it loads me in a more hip dominant position and often a more forward foot position, which will allow for transfer to sport as opposed to the front squat, unless my sport is Olympic weightlifting my sport is Olympic weightlifting, I'm likely going to use the back squat, but likely use maybe more of a front squat execution, keeping that upright torso uh, to have a better transfer to the movement specific to that sport. Similarly with the deadlift, um, I will use each variation. The straight bar has more execution, or more, more need for cueing, uh, need for learning as opposed to the hex bar deadlift. Uh, the movement patterns are very similar. However, the range of motion has changed. The position of the hands has changed. The stress on the back has changed. You're likely going to have um, more stress on the back in a straight bar compared to the, the trap bar. Um, as long as you're, you're keeping execution pretty consistent, you'll be able to load the knee musculature more with the hex bar as opposed to the, the straight bar. But think about it is, it, is it good or is it bad? Is it what I need? Is it not what I need? Um, and, and program accordingly. You can always lift the barbell up or use plates or blocks or something to shorten the range of motion of your straight bar deadlift to have the same range of motion as your hex bar deadlift. Um, but if we look at the hand position, that neutral hand position is going to give us the best for holding the most resistance as opposed to a pronated grip. It's also going to put us in a more stable shoulder position Rather than an internally rotated position, we're a little bit more externally rotated, creating more tension within the shoulder complex, um, hopefully allowing us to hold more resistance and lift more resistance. So benefits and drawbacks to each. You can jump using a hex bar. It's very difficult to jump without using maybe a weightlifting derivative using a straight bar. Um, so there's, there's positives, there's negatives, and we can, we can alter them and use them throughout our program, periodize them, so that we can get the most out of our athletes. So think through these different topics for discussion. Think about these for your questions for class um, so that we can really discuss the best and, and the more optimal uses of each of these exercises. Um, I'll give you a, a quick regressions and progressions um, outlook. If we look at complexity in the squat exercise, our air squat or our, our body weight squat is the least complex. Um, then we move to a goblet squat where we're holding a weight out in front of us, as we see here. The dumbbell front squat would be our next more complex exercise. Now we're using, um, rather than holding the weight with both hands, we're holding each with individual hands. Becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, then we move to the high bar back squat, which we looked as our, our back squat variation that we talked about in class. The next complex is a low bar back squat. It requires greater range of motion, um, more strength through the posterior chain. Then we move to the front squat, which is a little bit more complex because we do have different range of motion, slightly different execution of the lift, uh, positions of our upper body and demands on our torso are different. And then lastly, the overhead squat where we're holding the barbell um, above our head is the most complex variation um, because now we have to stabilize the bar um, using our shoulder complex and then our torso then move the weights using our hip and knee musculature. That is the most complex variation. If we look at from the, the realm of maximal resistance, which variation can I use the most load? Um, it's going to have slightly different variations. The first three are the same. The body weight squat is going to be your lowest resistance. Then the goblet squat, then the dumbbell front squat. Then we'll move to the overhead squat, which is going to be our next maximally loaded exercise because you can only load it as much as you can stabilize above your head. Next level is the front squat. We have to be able to hold it in that front rack position, which is more challenging than the back rack position. Then the high bar back squat, because the high bar back squat has a slightly larger range of motion in most cases, um, and often more recruitment of the knee musculature. Uh, 
we're not going to be able to load it as much as the low bar back squat. Low bar back squat is most conducive to loading. It's likely what you'll use if you're using the sport of power lifting um, because it will allow you to have a wider stance, more hip loading, um, and the most or the slightly the least stress on the low back because that torque lever has been shortened. Um, but you're going to be able to lift the most weight in that position. Um, seeing that you have the range of motion requisites for each of these exercises. If we look at those regressions and progressions for the deadlift, we start with the banded deadlift, move to the dumbbell deadlift, then the snatch grip deadlift. Because of the hand position, it's going to be more challenging and a greater range of motion for that lift. Next, the deficit deadlift, which we would stand on a box or stand on a two to four inch lift. So now it increases the range of motion of the, of the deadlift position. The next would be a standard barbell deadlift, um, which would have us lifting the barbell off of the floor. The next would be the trap bar deadlift, which we're lifting it in this inside the trap bar position with those neutral handles. And lastly would be the rack pull, which is starting the deadlift from a slightly higher position. So shortening the range of motion, that's going to be the least or the what's going to allow us for the most maximal weight to be lifted. Um, if we look at complexity wise, um, same band and deadlift are going to be first. They're going to be the simplest exercise. Next would be the rack pull because of the shortened range of motion. It's going to be easier. Similarly with the trap bar, it's going to be easier in execution than the barbell deficit and then the snatch grip barbell deadlift is going to be our most complex because we have to change hand position. We have a greater range of motion, uh, more demands on the grip um, and the hip musculature in order to lift that weight off the ground. But this bilateral hinge squat pattern has great transfer to sport. So we can see this athlete blocking. They are in that hip hinged position, using that forward toe position in order to drive into their opponent. We're using that squat position to set up, um, to set a volleyball. We're using that position to jump into the air. We're also using that position to stand from a chair or to lift a box from the ground. We're using a deadlift. They were using a bilateral hinging movement to pick that weight up off the ground. Um, you look at kids, they squat all the time. Um, squatting down to, to reach the ground and then using that, that position to stand and rise, to get up out of bed, to get out of a chair. The longer we're able to squat heavier than our body weight, the longer we're going to be able to get out of the chair, get off the toilet, get out of our bed, and keep moving and keep living functional lives and healthy lives long term. All right, um, think about those questions that we had for our topics of discussion. Um, what are similarities and differences, cues, progressions, range of motion, loading abilities, velocity abilities. We talked about some of those progressions and, and loading already. Some benefits and drawbacks, muscle actions, programming, periodization. Think of your questions and let's discuss them more in our class. All right, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you for our next video.